So with all the attention on CO2, global climate change, um, why is snow so important? Snow is incredibly important to, to the Earth's uh, climate because of its control on the response of the Earth system to climate change. Uh, snow is incredibly bright, uh, so on average it's incredibly bright, and it reflects a lot of radiation back to, to space, and so that doesn't get absorbed by the system and, uh, and heat the atmosphere. It also uh, is a great insulator and uh, therefore prevents a lot of exchange of energy. And so it keeps, it keeps the climate relatively stable over broad regions where there's, where there's extensive snow cover. It also is uh, incredibly important for over a billion of uh, the Earth's population from its snow melt, uh, providing the dominant water, fresh water resource uh, to those people. On the poster, there's a lot of acronyms. Um, two that stand out are Mod Skag and Mod DRFS. Can you just tell us a little more about each of those and what they mean? The Mod Skag uh, model is the modus snow covered area and grain size model. This comes out of our work on imaging spectroscopy for many years and applied to the multi spectral modus sensor. And it does a simultaneous solution for fractional snow cover. So per pixel, how much of that is covered by snow? And then of that snow cover, that fractional snow cover, what is the average snow grain size? And from that, then the control of grain size, or the change in grain size, gives a change in the reflectivity of the snow surface. And this allows us then to know what that reflectivity is for that partial snow cover um, in, in each pixel. Um, and this is applying a spectroscopic technique as opposed to some of the older uh, techniques of, of band differences and band normalization. This does a, a direct uh, linear algebra treatment and a, a physically based treatment through radiative transfer to get at a far more robust retrieval. The mod DRFS is the, the modus dust radiative forcing in snow product, and it's not just for dust, it's for any junk that gets into the snow that absorbs sunlight. Um, and in the last several years, we've really started to understand the impact of these absorbing impurities, dust, black carbon, uh, biological material, organic material that, uh, that coats grains of, of dust. Um, we're understanding that those absorb a lot of sunlight and conduct that energy into the snow that surrounds them. So it brings the snow cover up to around zero degrees C much sooner and after the snow has gotten to zero degrees C then all that additional radiation goes into melting the snow. And in western Colorado, where we have very detailed and unique measurements uh, from towers, so not the remote sensing, but towers where we have a good handle on the energy balance and the mass balance of the snowpack, we know that this dust radiative forcing, so how much additional sunlight is going into the snowpack because of the dust and black carbon, is causing the snowpack to melt away somewhere between one and two months earlier compared to what uh, the climate change scenarios, two to four degrees C increase in temperature, are producing as about one to two weeks difference in melt out. So, so these absorbing impurities are very important to the energy balance of the snowpack, the control on the melt, and when you extend that and realize that that snow cover on top of glaciers is a great insulator. So the, the glacial ice underneath the snow cover essentially doesn't know what's going on above it. Right? But as soon as the snow cover melts away, then that energy is heading into, into the glacier, being absorbed strongly by, by the glacier and melting away. So the earlier that you remove snow cover, the more energy can get into that glacier and the sooner that that can melt. If you do that every year, if you move that snow cover off earlier every year because of some change in dust load, then that's pushing this glacier into a new equilibrium. And uh, until very recently, um, there has not been any remote sensing retrieval of this radiative forcing. So there's been no way to know what this impact is over broad expanses other than with the tower measurements that we have. 
And so the Mod DRFS product, the Modus Dust Radiative Forcing and Snow product, is now available uh, on the JPL Snow server. And, um, and we are digging into our understanding in the Himalaya, in the Hindu Kush, in the Western US, and at AGU, um, as shown on the poster, we have some very exciting results showing what impact the dust rate reinforcing is having on uh, river runoff forecasting by the National Weather Service uh, River Forecast Center. So I encourage you to, uh, to go to that talk as well by Annie Bryant. On the poster, there is a talk about future applications of the system. Uh, the number one listed being the Airborne Snow Observatory. Uh, can you just tell us a little more about what that is and what, what, what makes it unique? So the Airborne Snow Observatory comes out of uh, our growing knowledge that the two most important facets of the snowpack that you need to understand to understand uh, the timing and magnitude of snow melt runoff in, in these basins around the globe, um, in these mountain basins around the globe, are the, the snow water equivalent, so just how much water is there in the entire snowpack, and then the snow albedo, which is the reflectivity of that surface. So about 90 to 95 percent of the energy available for melting the snowpack comes from the absorbed sunlight for an exposed uh, snow cover. And so um, slowly we've been converging to this and, and just recently then we have built the Airborne Snow Observatory which is a combination of a, an imaging LIDAR uh, which gives us very precise uh, measurements of the snow depth um, and with additional information about snow density then we can get at the snow water equivalent. Uh, in a spatially variable uh, or spatially complete wall-to-wall -wall capacity um, and on the Airborne Snow Observatory we're flying this uh, such that we will have about five meter spatial resolution. So that's giving us the snow water equivalent. The other side of this is the snow albedo and this comes from an imaging spectrometer and it's a technology that has been uh, developed here at JPL over the last 25 years, um, and JPL is recognized as the world leader in, in uh, imaging spectrometers and imaging spectroscopy. Um, and so from, from the spectrometer we get hundreds of colors of reflected light, and from that we can know what the total albedo is of the surface, the total reflectivity, and we can also know across the spectrum whether it's being reduced, that reflectivity is being reduced by changes in the snow grain size or by the, the dust and black carbon. And, um, and so not only knowing the, the changes in, in the albedo, but also going to the more quantitative ability to uh, attribute this, uh, the, this change in albedo into these components. The, the change in grain size coming from uh, either from the light absorbing impurities, the dust and black carbon, or from changes in the climate, or the impact coming from the, the dust and black carbon, which comes from land use change and industrial pollutants, uh, biomass burning. Um, and as our knowledge is improving and, uh, and we make this push to understand policy uh, and science, uh, better together to be able to make better uh, decisions for how we treat our climate and we treat our water resources, we treat our mountain glaciers. Um, we need to have an understanding of what the impacts are coming from these various constituents and if uh, mitigation is uh, taking place, so a reduction say in, in black carbon emissions or, uh, or change in land use that reduces uh, dust emission, we need to be able to monitor the efficacy of that, uh, that reduction in those impurities and what it means in terms of the snowpack as well as what it means for water resources and, and glacier health. So the Airborne Snow Observatory is uh, a technology that's not unique globally but it is unique um, for um, for the application to snow and uh, glacier science. Um, and we are targeting 
uh, activities in the western U.S. as, rel as well as around the globe um, and working carefully with um, water managers in the western U.S. to uh, ultimately implement this as the technology for water management for the future. Just to wrap it up, is there anything else you want to tell the folks at AGU who might be watching this uh, video standing by the poster? This team uh, that that I've been working with, uh, the lead author, uh, Cam Goodale and Chris Matman, uh, Paul Ramirez, uh, Andrew Hart, Paul Zimdars, this is an amazing crew uh, and they've done an amazing job of spinning up uh, these technologies, um, the Snow Data Server, and adapting to um, my severe ADD and and uh, bouncing around and bouncing around in ideas and and adapting. Um, so that's one thing that I want to tell you. The other is that uh, just for for the scientists and the technologists out there, we live in an incredible time. And if anybody tells you that your idea is crazy or there's no way know full well that they have absolutely no idea whether they're they're right and you can do amazing things but you have to make sure that you get the right people you have to get the right technology and you have to push hard